Hello and welcome to this talk about bringing a judicial review claim. My name is Declan O'Dempsey, I'm a barrister at Cloisters Chambers and in this talk I'm going to be dealing with the stages after permission has been granted to you to bring your claim for judicial review. One of the things that will happen at the hearing, if you have one, for permission is that the judge at the end of it will give directions for what they call the substantive hearing. So that's going to be the final hearing uh, of your case. So the substantive hearing is going to be the hearing at which both sides are heard by the judge and which the judge, or in some cases judges, decide on the merits of each side's argument. The judge can order that the case should be heard on a particular date. So that will either happen at the permission hearing or you may get an indication of that on the order which was made simply by considering the papers in the case. Otherwise, the administrative court office lists the substantive hearing as soon as practicable. So that means you need to think about preparing for the final hearing really as soon as the permission hearing is finished. The judge can make orders for how the case is to be conducted either when making the paper order, the order on consideration of the papers, granting permission for the case to proceed, or uh, at the hearing at which permission is granted. Now, there are standard directions, but these only apply if the judge didn't make directions when giving permission to bring the claim. But in many cases, the standard directions will apply. So you must pay the relevant fee to continue the application for judicial review within seven days of permission being granted. If you don't do this, the administrative court office sends you a notice requiring payment within a set time frame and this is normally seven more days. If you still don't pay the fee then this will result in your claim being struck out without any further order being made. The next standard direction is that any party who wishes to contest or support the claim must file and serve any detailed grounds and any written evidence within 35 days of permission being granted. So this is where the defendant needs to put in detailed grounds and their written evidence in reply to your claim. You have to file and serve a skeleton argument no less than 21 working days before the substantive hearing. So as soon as you get the hearing date, of course, put that date in your diary. But really, it's not sensible to leave starting preparing the skeleton argument until you're running up against this type of time limit. Try and prepare it early in the process. You'll need to have in front of you what the other side is saying about your case, so the detailed grounds. But even before you've got that, you can be putting together the skeleton argument which supports your case. Now in a later talk, I'm going to be dealing with the contents of the skeleton argument and how you set it out. But for the moment, bear in mind that you need to start working on this early and then when you get the detailed grounds from the defendant, you can incorporate some of your replies to what they're saying into your skeleton argument. Another direction which applies in relation to skeleton arguments is the timescales for preparation of skeleton arguments by the defendant and other parties. So the rule here is that if they want to make representations at the substantive hearing, they must file and serve a skeleton argument no less than 14 days 
before the substantive hearing. Now another direction that's made deals with compiling the bundle and it's worth spending a little bit of time on this, so I will. One of the most important directions is the direction on the bundle. The standard direction is that you, the claimant, must file a paginated and indexed bundle of all relevant documents which are required for the hearing of your judicial review claim at the same time that you file the skeleton argument. So this means unless there's a judicial order allowing for a different period that you will need to do it within 21 days before the merits hearing, the substantive hearing. The bundle must include those documents which are required by the defendant and any other party who's going to be making representations at the hearing, as well as just your documents. The party should be liaising as far before the substantive hearing as possible to agree what is required in the agreed bundle. Now this is what the Administrative Courts Guide on Judicial Review says. And you should take that seriously. So how do you go about compiling a bundle? First of all, you should do a first draft of the bundle. Get all the documents into chronological order, put them in a timeline. Sometimes that can seem a bit of a daunting task and people simply don't do it and that causes all sorts of confusion. So you can do it quite simply by putting all the documents from one year into one pile and other years into a different pile. And now you go through each of those piles, sorting them into groups of months. So all the documents from January go in one, etc. And now you go through each month and put that pile into the date order. And you will have, when you put it all together, a chronological bundle. The next step you should take is to write an index. Now this is not your final index. What you do is to have a column saying what document number the document has, so document one and so forth. Then the next column is a description of what the document is, who it's from, who it's to, and a short summary of what the subject matter is. So that doesn't mean going into any great detail, but just saying what roughly it's about so people can identify the document. Don't use that column to try and argue things. Once you've got that index together, talk to the defendant and other parties, offer to send your draft index to them and ask them what documents they want in the bundle. When they tell you, put their documents into the bundle in the correct chronological place. Now you can incorporate them into your draft index and of course the document numbering will change, don't worry about that because ultimately you're not going to use the document numbering. When you've agreed what documents should go in the bundle, then put the bundle together and insert at the bottom right hand corner of each page a unique page number. So the bundle is numbered from page 1 to the end without repeating numbers. Don't restart the numbering for different types of document. Even if you have dividers in the bundle, don't restart the numbering. Take the point about liaising as far as possible uh, before the substantive hearing very seriously. You should have the bundle ready well before the time you need to prepare your skeleton argument so that you and everyone else can make cross-references to pages of the bundle in the argument. If you don't do this, it doesn't get you any real advantage. You won't prevent the other side from making reference to the documents they want to refer to, but you will delay matters, maybe waste time, and that may result in a cost penalty against you, even if you win your case ultimately. After permission has been granted, you may want to file further evidence or rely on grounds which you haven't mentioned already. Now you can do this, but if you want to do this, you have to get the court's permission. In order to get the court's permission, you have to make 
what's called an interim application. Now I'm going to deal with these later on in another talk, but essentially what you need to do is to set out the new stuff alongside the old stuff that you want to rely on. And a good way of making sure that the court understands what is the new stuff is by underlining the new stuff you want to rely on. And if you're striking out bits of the old stuff, then you can put a line uh, through the old stuff so that the court can still see what the old stuff was, but appreciates that you're no longer relying on it. Now, the same rule applies to another party that wants to do either of those things, rely or file further evidence or rely uh, on further grounds. If their 35-day time limit for putting in their grounds and evidence has passed, they also need to get permission to amend their documents. Now, the court can deal with an application like that either in advance of the substantive hearing or at the hearing itself. You get to indicate your preference when you're lodging your interim application, but it is up to the judge. The judge's discretion will be affected by those principles that I mentioned in the first talk contained in the overriding objective. So when you're making your application, and if you want to have the point of amendment decided before the full hearing, the substantive hearing, then it's important to tie in what you're saying to the objectives contained in that overriding objective of the court. Whether or not you get your amendment is up to the judge's discretion. But bear in mind that that discretion has to have regard to the overriding objective that I talked about in the first of these talks. So when you're making your argument as to why you should get your amendment, you should make reference to how your argument furthers the overriding objective. So, for example, that it's proportionate to allow your amendment, that the amendment can be done at proportionate cost, and that it furthers the overriding objective of dealing with cases justly. Now, there are some situations uh, when you should think about ending the claim rather than seeking to amend the claim. If the defendant has reconsidered the original decision and provided a fresh decision on which it now seeks to rely, then it may not be appropriate to seek to amend and it may be more appropriate to end the claim. The point is you can seek to challenge the new decision by commencing a new claim. There are a couple of narrow exceptions, however. These are situations in which the court may be prepared to consider the challenge to the original, the initial decision. So first of all, if the case raises a point of general public importance, and secondly, if the point which is at issue in relation to the original decision is still an important issue in relation to the subsequent decision. I want to say a few words about interpreters. The general rule is that the party needing the interpreter pays for and arranges for the attendance of the interpreter. However, in certain situations, the administrative court office can arrange for an interpreter to attend free of charge to the party who seeks assistance if that person's a litigant in person uh, and they cannot address the court in the language uh, of the case, English or Welsh, and they can't afford to pay for an interpreter and don't qualify for legal aid and don't have a friend or family member who the judge agrees can act as an interpreter. Secondly, the judge uh, agrees that an interpreter should be arranged uh, free of charge uh, to the party. And then, more generally, in circumstances 
where the court has made an order uh, that the interpreter should be provided free of charge to the party needing the interpreter. What should you do if you're going to require an interpreter and you can't afford one? Well, if you're going to request an interpreter free of charge, you must make the request for the interpreter to the administrative court uh, in writing as soon as it becomes clear that a hearing uh, will have to be listed and that an interpreter is required. So you'll be making that request either as part of your applications for directions, because remember the judge can order it, or as soon as you can after permission to proceed to the full hearing has been given. So you must write to the court office saying that an interpreter is required. You should state what language the interpreter will be required to translate into the language of the court, either English or Welsh, and vice versa. If you don't notify the court and a hearing has to be adjourned for an interpreter to attend on another occasion, then the court may make an adverse costs order against you. Next, a few words about the responsibility for the production of serving prisoners and detained persons. If you're represented by counsel, then you won't be produced at court unless the court orders otherwise. Uh, if you don't have legal representation, then you must arrange uh, for your own attendance at court or for a video link to be arranged between the court and the prison or detention centre at which you are. So you should make that request uh, to the prison or detention centre authorities. You should do this as soon as you receive notice of the hearing. Those authorities are responsible for considering requests for production or for arranging uh, video links. To finish off this talk, I'd like to say a few words about skeleton arguments, documents and authorities. Now, I'm going to be dealing with these matters in later talks, uh, so just remember that you will need to be thinking about how to construct your skeleton argument um, after you've been given permission to proceed to the full hearing. Can you make your skeleton argument shorter? Can you make it uh, just a series of headlines of the things you want to say rather than the entirety of the written argument. We'll come back to that later on. I'll also say a few more words about documents in a later talk. One other thing that you need to be thinking about at this time is, are the authorities that you and the defendant are going to rely upon. And these are the legal cases that you've found uh, which you want to use to persuade the judge about the way in which the law should be interpreted and which will help the judge to decide your case. Now, those very often form a separate bundle which the parties agree about. But you should consider whether there are any case law authorities that you want to refer to, and then talk to the defendant and others about formulating a bundle of those case authorities which can be put in front of the judge. As I say, we'll come back to some of these matters in later talks.